hope you get a sense for what the Explore God is really all about and, uh, and be thinking about who you could engage in exploring the love of God in their life. Let's pray before we open God's Word together. Father, once more we come before you and we, ha- we acknowledge that because your Word tells us that it's living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It's able to penetrate our thoughts and our hearts. And though sometimes we resist that, we really need that. So speak to us now through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been with us for any length of time, you know that we're in a series, or a theme really, between now all the way up to Advent, Christmas season, called With Jesus. What does it mean to live life in the 21st century with Jesus? How is that even possible? I mean, he's not physically here. When he called the first disciples to follow him, it was to be with him. It wasn't a nine-to-five thing, a part-time thing, a sometime thing. It was live your life with me. Is the call different for us? Do we get to, you know, plug in and unplug from Jesus, or are we called to live with him all the time? And if so, what does that actually mean, and what does it look like? And we just finished a mini-series on eating with Jesus, which is a weird thing to study, but we we're talking about the people Jesus ate with. What, is it, what does that tell us about who he is and who he cares about and what his kingdom is, and what does it mean for us to be at his table, which we'll come to at the close of this service? Being with Jesus means listening to his teaching as well as observing who he spent time with. When you read through the Gospels, you hear Jesus addressing all kinds of contemporary issues. Marriage, sexuality, politics, money, treatment of your neighbor, all kinds of things he speaks about. What if you were in the first century in Judea, Palestine, you're making your way down a dusty road and you see a big crowd on the hillside. You go over to the crowd and you realize they're listening to somebody. Oh, it's this Yeshua you've heard about. And he's standing on a hillside and he's teaching the crowd and you're there in the crowd. What would you be most likely to hear him talk about? What was Jesus' favorite subject? What did he talk about most often? We all have, you know people that have their thing, right? There are people that every time you're around that guy, he talks about politics. Every time you're around her, she talks about her kids. We all have the thing we talk about most. What was the thing Jesus was always talking about? Anybody want to take a guess? You're not going to guess because I'm going to write it down for you. The kingdom. Almost everything you know that you hear Jesus say about love your neighbor as yourself and do unto others and all those kinds of things, they were about life in the kingdom. This was his favorite subject. Almost every one of his parables, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, begins with this little line, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like. Jesus was talking about the kingdom. He was announcing the kingdom. In fact, he he said things about the kingdom and about life that were shocking and difficult to others to understand, and to us today as well. This little series we're in is called Wrestling with Jesus. We're going to wrestle over his teaching on all issues of life, and we're going to start with his favorite subject, the kingdom. Because many of the times, I think we think because of familiarity, we know what Jesus meant. But if we're honest, he's got some things to say to us that are little unsettling. What did Jesus talk about most? The kingdom. If you were to happen upon Jesus, that's what we'd be talking about. Now, we already uh, are kind of at a disadvantage because we don't know what king, we don't, kingdoms is not a language we use today, is it? I don't know what you think of when you think of kingdoms. I read a lot of uh, stories when I was a kid. I still read a lot of stories. C.S. Lewis said when he was a young man, and an atheist, he was embarrassed to be caught reading fairy tales and fantasies. Now he reads them as as an adult openly and with pride. I, I was always reading stories. And so I think of King Arthur. I think of knights in shining armor. Maybe you think of that when you think of kings and kingdoms. You know, we don't have kings. Maybe you think of like the royal wedding. That's not a real king. That's just a figurehead. But anyway, let's just put a little king up here, shall we? Maybe this is what comes into your mind when you think about the king or kingdoms. I don't know about you, but kings, kings in, in England always had very nice beards, very well manicured beards. And there you have to have the banners and a window for the damsel. Is that enough? Okay, there we go. Kings and kingdoms. Maybe you think about that when you think of the kingdom. But the biblical theme of the kingdom, it runs right throughout. It's not a new subject with Jesus. It's not something he invented or, or started. He's talking about something that's been part of the story of God. In fact, you could make the argument that the theme of the kingdom is really the whole story of the Bible. If you have your Bible, open to Mark chapter 1. Verses 9 through 19. 
This is in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He sort of appears on the scene here. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And believe the gospel. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen and said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father in the boat and followed him. So, you know, Jesus gets, he's in the wilderness uh, being tempted by Satan He comes out of the wilderness and he goes and is baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And what's the first thing he says? First thing that Mark says Jesus says when he comes out of the water. The kingdom's here. First words. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the good news, the gospel, because the kingdom is here. Let's look at Matthew's account of the same thing. Matthew 4, verses 17 through 23. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While they were walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. You'll recognize this story. Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Notice that in both passages there's this phrase, the gospel, or the, your Bible might say the good news of the kingdom. The gospel is the good news of the kingdom. Whenever you read through the New Testament gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find kingdom and gospel, good news and gospel, and kingdom go right together. They're linked. The word for good news or gospel, some of you will know this, is the word, Greek word, euangelion. It literally means good news, good announcement, glad tidings. Something has happened and it's good news. They didn't have newspapers in the first century, but we almost don't have them now either. Anyway, good news. That's what it means. The good news, the good announcement of the kingdom. And in Greek, ancient Greek, euangelion, by the way, that's where we get our word evangelical, which you hear referenced all the time in in the media, which is a pejorative term these days. But its original meaning was people of the good news, people of the good announcement. What's the good announcement? The king has come to set things right. Evangelicals are supposed to be people committed to that good news of who Jesus is. The, the, the gospel, good news, it, it's an announcement. In the ancient world, it was an announcement of something about a king. Often a king's birth, good news, a new king is born. Or a king's victory, good news, our king is won. That's why they use this phrase. So the first question of the kingdom I want to ask is, who is the king? If the king has come, who is the king? And this is really the question, like fundamental to human life. Go, go look out your window. When you drive home from here, as you drive down the road, or when you get home and you flip on cable news or you check your news feed, don't you often wonder, who's in charge here? Who's running the show? Is anybody in charge here? It's a legitimate question. Who's in control? Who's in charge? Who is the king? Now, the answer the ancient Israelites would have given to this question is clear throughout the Old Testament. Let's just take one place of many, many, many we could choose uh, from Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. That's kingdom language. Reigning, thrones, ruling. 
The Lord, Yahweh, God is king. Okay, well, that's, it's one thing. I don't know if you're like me. It's one thing to say I believe that God is king when I'm looking at a beautiful sunset or if I'm staring at my, my baby sleeping. I don't have babies anymore, but back in the day. Yeah, I'm going to stare at my 22-year-old sleeping. That would be creepy, but anyway. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When you watch a sunrise or a sunset or you see a child smile, it's, it's natural to think God is king. Look at the goodness of creation. And for many of you, it, you, you automatically agree, yes, God is king. But for many of us, here and in this world, we go, yeah, but, yeah, but for every child laughing, there's a child crying in the world. What about all the pain and the suffering and what about all just the stuff I just get tired of? All the divisiveness and the anger. How is God king in the midst of that? So while we affirm that God is king, we also affirm, and the Bible affirms this because we won't have time to do it, but if you read Psalm 93, it's all about the, how God is king, the Lord is king. You read Psalm 94, the next chapter, and it's all about where are you if you're king? How long will you wait, God? How long will you allow the wicked to win, God? So the, the pronouncement that God is king and the question of where is the king go hand in hand in the scripture and in our own hearts. So we acknowledge that while God is king, there's also another kingdom at work in the world, another will at work in the world. And really, the, the story of the Bible is the story of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And the truth is, the kingdom of God is the one advancing. Since the break, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is not abstract theology. This is real life that each of us must deal with. If God is in fact king, is he asleep on the job? Is he reigning without, any, is he not paying attention? And this is not a new problem. In Genesis 1, God makes Humans, men and women, equal and in God's image. Male and female, he created them. In the image of God, he created them. And we don't often pay attention to this. He gave us a job to do. He didn't say, just hang out and enjoy each other in creation. He said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and rule over it or subdue it. He used kingdom language. He made us in his image to be like partners with him in r running the world, his world. We're like co-regents, you know, lesser kings and queens. You ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? Aslan is the lord of Narnia, but King Peter, Queen Susan, Edmund and Lucy, they had their royalty. Lewis is saying that, that's something about when we're made in the image of God, we're made in the image of a king, and he's given us work to do in his kingdom. And if there's real possibility of partnering with the king and running his creation, then there's also real possibility of us getting it wrong, right? And we do. Genesis 3 is about that. The split, the break. We don't want God as king. We can rule on our own. We want to be our own kings and queens. We know better than he does. We don't trust him, and we decide to do it our own way. And the story of the Bible is a story about God reclaiming his kingdom reestablishing the people in his kingdom. And that's the story that we're in. The story of this world. It's a clash of kingdoms. You see it every day, don't you? If you're paying attention, you see it and you feel it every day. And you'd have to have your head in the sand not to have felt it this last couple of weeks with the nomination and vote for a new Supreme Court nominee. And I won't get into that because some of you will get upset and walk out for the wrong reasons. What I'm saying is you feel the clash of kingdoms all the time in our world, in our own hearts. All the time, if you're paying attention. This means that God's will, which operates in God's kingdom, is not the only will that's operational in the world. There's another will. Our wills and the will of the evil one. Who's going to win in this clash of kingdoms? God is. Spoiler alert. God wins. How's he going to win? Well, that's the story of the Bible. That's the, not the gospel message. That's the good news that Jesus came to announce. But he's not a king like you think he's a king. And he doesn't win like you think he's going to win. 
The story of the Bible works out God's response to this hostile kingdom takeover in our hearts and in the world. And you can trace it from Eden to the, to the Israel's history, to the prophets, and then Jesus comes. In fact, let's read from Isaiah 40, verses 9 through 11. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. God's coming, and he's powerful, but he's also tender like a shepherd, the king who is a shepherd. This is over and over again in the prophets. We hear this longing for the king to come, the good news that he's going to come. And Isaiah's writing when the actual physical, political kingdom of Israel has been taken captive and is in disarray. So the prophets, we should draw a prophet because they're fun to draw. I don't know if prophets were bald, but in my mind they are. And they have very big beards. And they're always shouting things. So there's the prophet. I don't know which one. We'll just call this one Isaiah. There, there's the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> shouting, the king, behold the good news, the king is coming. So when Jesus comes on the scene, we already read two accounts, right? The first thing he says is, the kingdom of heaven is here. The good news is here. That which you was lost way back in Genesis 3 and has been tried to regain through Israel's history, but they made a mess of it, even asking for a physical king. And God says, I should be your king. And they said, we want a king like the other people have a king. And God gives them a king, and it doesn't go well for them. It's the same story over and over again, you see. Jesus comes on the scene and says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. The good news of the kingdom. In fact, we see this in John chapter 12, verses 14 through 15. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, conquering kings and emperors and rulers would enter the city they'd conquered or returning from victory on a giant war horse. It's, it's a little, God has a sense of humor. He chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong, the foolish things to shame the wise. So our king is not like anybody would have expected You'll have to forgive me on this one, because whenever you draw Jesus, it's just, you know, you, you're taking a big risk. <laughs> but our king comes in riding on a donkey, not like anybody would have expected. Who said that? Could have been a donkey. There, that's our king. Looks more like a cow, but anyway. Our king comes not like you'd expect, not the conquering hero. And, and the Jews of Jesus' day, they wrestled with this because they expected a king to do what? There's another kingdom. At the time of Jesus, the kingdom of the world was Rome and Caesar. Our king, when he comes, is going to throw out Caesar and Rome. Nobody expected a king who would be humble and lowly, riding a donkey. Go to a cross. That just made no sense. They expected a political and military king. I, I think many evangelical Christians today, we also get confused politically. We also get our, our idea of the kingdom mixed up. We conflate it with one party, one candidate, one policy, or another. And I'm not arguing for one or the other. I'm saying we're different. We serve a different king who has a different agenda. It has always been so. Caesar and Rome were just the current powers of the kingdom. Why is it that as image-bearing daughters and sons of the king, we get stuff wrong, we know what we should do, but we don't do it. And then we create cultures and societies that don't do it. Then we create civilizations who don't do what God wants us to do. This is just the story of the world. It's the story of the first century and the 10th century and the 21st century. 
So let's ask the question, what is the kingdom? What is the kingdom? Simply put, the kingdom is the rule and reign of Jesus on earth and in every human heart. What's the kingdom? The rule and reign of Jesus. Uh, in Graham Goldsworthy's book called Gospel and Kingdom, you can get on Amazon. It's a small little book. I highly recommend it. It's a quick trip of theology through the story of the Bible. Graham Goldsworthy, Gospel and Kingdom. He says, The sphere of Christ's rule in which his subjects willingly submit to his righteous reign in their lives and in the world, this is the kingdom. The sphere in which we submit to the rule of Christ in my own life is the kingdom. When more people come together doing that, that's the kingdom. So where are we in the story? Right? You ever go like to a, play, a, I don't know, a mall or a, who goes to malls anymore? Nobody. But you, you go a place and you see the map, the you are here signs, you know? The story is the, kingdom, the king is going to return, and he's going to establish his rule in perfect righteousness and justice. But until that, we're living in God's kingdom advancing. We're living here. Two kingdoms at war, in my own heart and in this world. When Jesus came and said the kingdom of heaven is here, people were saying, well, where? The same way we say it. What is the kingdom? It's the rule and reign of Jesus. So we're, we're not... We're not, we're not we don't subscribe to the John Mayer philosophy of life. I'm just waiting on the world to change, right? That's not how Christians are. We're not sitting around doing nothing. We're ambassadors of the king and agents of the kingdom in the world. Jesus is saying a long-awaited king has come. And the long-expected kingdom is now beginning. It's here. We're citizens. U.S. citizens, sure. But heavenly citizens of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is advancing. It's arrived in Jesus, and it's advancing through his followers until its completion when he returns. In Luke 17, the, the leaders are asking, well, where is this kingdom? And Jesus says, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom would have come and where it would appear, he said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. No one will say, look, here it is, or there. Behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, among you. Remember when Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am also? It's in your heart, it's in my heart, it's in us as his people, in the world. Remember the question of the ultimate question of the kingdom I asked you at the beginning? The question was, who's in charge here? Who's the king? Who's calling the shots? Let's put that question to ourselves, friends. Who's in charge of your life? Who's calling the shots in your heart? You want to know where the kingdom is? Start there. Is your life under the rule and reign of Jesus? I don't mean sometimes, but I mean all of it. It's my life. Is the way you speak to your spouse under the reign of Jesus? Is the way you conduct your business practices under the rule and reign of Jesus? Is the way you spend your money and give your money under the rule and reign of Jesus? Is the way you use your leisure time under the rule and reign of Jesus? Is the way you use your social media accounts under the rule and reign of Jesus. Just go right down the list of your life and ask yourself those questions. You want to know where the kingdom is? Start there. I, I've been doing it in my own life, bringing my whole life under the rule and reign of Jesus. That's where the kingdom is supposed to be. Where is the kingdom? When a neighbor opens her home to share a meal and to share the love of God with someone next door, there is the kingdom. When a couple on the verge of giving up on their marriage finds grace and healing and restoration against all odds, there is the kingdom. When a businessman invites one of his partners to join him at 6 a.m. every Friday morning to learn about this God who loves him, there is the kingdom. When a couple decides to retire, not in comfort, but to use their energy and wealth to start a foundation to serve the poor in South America, there is the kingdom. When a small group, suburban, wealthy, small group, pulls its money every month to anonymously bless someone in need in their community, there is the kingdom. When an army of volunteers gives up their Saturday morning to come here so they can bless over 100 children with special needs and their families, there's the kingdom. 
when children in the foster care system for one week every summer get loved on through Royal Family Kids Camp because God loves them and values them. There is the kingdom. When children in Rwanda are rescued off the street and given a home called Hope for Life, started by a group of people where one of our own women who grew up in this church is serving, there's the kingdom. When 14 to 18 year old young men just down the street at the Illinois Youth Center, incarcerated in the prison system as a teenager, are met with monthly to be encouraged and have the gospel shared with them, there is the kingdom. When men find freedom and healing from sexual addiction, hidden sins in our compass ministry, there is the kingdom. When women are rescued out of sex trafficking through Naomi's house, there is the kingdom. Whenever a group of people, imperfect as we are, broken as we are, gather to pray and ask God to bring his will into our lives and into our world, there is the kingdom. You don't see it on Fox News or CNN. You don't see it in the places you ordinarily look. The king is not who everyone thinks he is, and the kingdom is not, does not come how we think it will come, but it's here. I just want to encourage you. We're going to finish by coming to the table of the king. After I pray, um, I'll bring, introduce the elements, but this is his table. And it doesn't matter if you're part of our church or another church or if you have no church at all. If you know King Jesus and know the forgiveness and grace that he offers, and if you've trusted him for forgiveness of sin, then you're welcome at his table. Because at the table, we find out what the kingdom really is. The kingdom doesn't come in power. Everyone must bow. The kingdom comes in weakness and humility at the cross. Bread and cup are symbols of body and blood. That's kingdom stuff. That's how he's called us to live. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that even though sometimes we look around and we only see one kind of kingdom, the kingdom of this world, you remind us that you are on the throne. You are king. Your kingdom is here. It is advancing, and it will come one day in all of its fullness and glory. Between that day and this day, O oh Lord, help us to remember your love, your humility, and your grace. We thank you in the name of our King, Jesus. Amen.